All right, uh, <clears throat> so we're, we just, we, what did we finish doing already? We spent some introductory time talking about the rules for arrow pushing that we're going to follow in this class, and I gave you seven rules for curved arrow pushing, and I expect you to follow those rules when we uh, work problems. Uh, <clears throat> then we talked about molecular orbitals, and in particular, frontier molecular orbitals, and how important it is to be able to assess the energies of orbitals. Electrons in higher energy orbitals are more reactive, so look for lone pairs. Those are usually in the highest energy orbitals. Start there with your arrows. And then you want to attack things. You want to add electrons to empty orbitals that are low in energy. So I told you it was important for you to memorize the energies of those six canonical frontier orbitals. Non-bonding lone pairs, pi bonds, sigma bonds, and then also uh, empty orbitals, like empty p orbitals, and then pi star and sigma star. So you need to memorize the, the energies of those. And have a, a, a sense for how does electronegativity affect the energies of those orbitals? How does bond length affect the energies of those orbitals? And how does conjugation affect the energies of those orbitals? You can go a long way to, to giving yourself confidence in arrow pushing if you have a sense for those trends. Now, frequently in this class, I'm not going to just draw diagrams that are empirical or arrow pushing is kind of empirical. Sometimes I'm going to give you quantitative energies, and I want to talk about that because how do we, how do you use an energy when somebody gives you an energy? And unfortunately, so far, I've just been giving you electron volt energies for these MO diagrams, which don't mean anything to you. You can't convert those into a, a useful intuition uh, if I give you specific numbers of energies of molecular orbitals. Let's go ahead and talk about why you might want to pay attention to numbers. So here's a quiz for you. There's two possible answers. Which one of these is more expensive? I hope everybody <laughs> knows the answer here. Um, uh, well, well, okay, so let's suppose I told you that you get a free helmet if you get the, the Spider-Man <laughs> Huffy bicycle. Right, that doesn't make any difference. There's this kind of issue that the order of magnitude, <laughs> that helmet doesn't make any difference. Once you understand the order of magnitude for the difference in costs here, um, uh, hopefully all of you would then pick that the Ferrari Enzo is the more expensive vehicle uh, for you to be riding. <clears throat> you know, but if I ask you how much more expensive, do you have some sense for that? How many times more expensive? What is the ratio of cost? Is it one to one? Is it 10 to one? Is it 100 to one? You know, you should have, be able to come up with, in your mind, some sort of a ratio. Does somebody have some guess as to the ratio? I don't even know. I'd have to calculate it off. I, mean, I think I know the prices of these. <laughs> one to one. <laughs> yeah, where'd you buy that Enzo? I'm going there to, <laughs> to get the, uh, you know, it's, as we see populations of molecules, um, it is important for you to have a sense for which ones are in higher population and which ones are in lower population and have some sense for the ratios. You don't have to know exact numbers, but there's a big difference between one to one and a million to one. Or, or in this case, maybe it would be 10 to the fifth to one would be the price ratio. Or if I ask you about the speed of these two vehicles, do you have some sort of a sense for how many times faster the Ferrari is than the bicycle? Right? You want to know how many times faster. Sometimes I'm going to tell you, but I'm going to disguise the way I'm telling you this information. I'll disguise populations of dollars, piles of cash. I'll disguise uh, rates, you know, the, the speed of things. And the way I'm going to disguise those things is I'm going to disguise those types of important intuitive numbers using kcals per mole. And these are not useful to you. So if I asked you what's the relative ratio of cost of these two vehicles in kcals per mole, could you tell me that? Right? If I gave you a mole of Huffy bicycles and a mole, and this is the way we talk in chemistry. If I gave you a mole of Huffy bicycles and a mole of Ferraris, what's the ratio of costs of those? It's the same ratio if you're talking about one bike versus one car, but it suddenly sounds more complex when we talk about per, on a per molar basis. The ratios don't change. Ratios of costs don't change. So we need to learn in this class at a very intuitive level how to take values in kcals per mole and convert them into numerical ratios. 10 to 1, 100 to 1, how many times faster is this step? Is it 1,000 times faster or 10 times faster or the same speed? You need to know how to do that, convert kcals per mole, because kcals per mole here is not useful to you or in chemistry. And so the way we're going to use this is we're going to use this Gibbs relationship, which I hope you've all been exposed to before. 
I'm not really good at math, so I'm not going to use this equation. I'm too dumb to use this equation. So let me show you how I work this equation here. You know, the, the basics of this equation is that any time you have two things that are in some sort of an equilibrium or in some sort of a competition, two things that are in equilibrium, A in equilibrium with B, or two things forming competitively, A and B are both forming, which one forms faster? Those are the two things we are interested in this class. Which thing happens faster and which thing is more stable once it does form? So those are the two things that we're interested in, and I'm going to tell you about those in kcals per mole. So here's, if I, if I slammed some numbers into this Gibbs relationship, what I would find is that when at equilibrium, if two species are present at a one-to-one -one ratio, what's the free energy difference for those species? Somebody knows this. Zero. Zero. It's zero kcals per mole. Right? I, that's something I remember. But what about this? Suppose things are present in a 10 to 1 ratio at equilibrium. What's the difference in kcals per mole? And this is the number that is money. I'll go ahead and tell you. The number is 1.4 kcals per mole difference in free energy. And I'm not going to keep writing kcals per mole. You get the idea. So if I've got two species that are present in a 10 to 1 ratio, 90 to 10, 10 to 1, that's kind of the same, then you should know that they're different in energy by about 1.4 kcals per mole. Now, <clears throat> what happens if the, the energy difference is, or if the ratio of those two species is 2.8 kcals per mole? Well, that's two, fact, two 1.4s. So 2.8 is a 1 to 100 ratio. You multiply the ratios, you add the free energies. That's the way that mathematical equation works. So guess what the free energy difference is if things are, are in equilibrium at a 1,000 to 1 ratio? 4.2. Yeah, 4.2. It's three, three factors of 1.4. You know, and if it's 4 kcals per mole, I'm, I just usually round it. Yeah, that's about a 1,000 to 1. Or what if it's 900 to 1? You know, that's good enough for me. I'm just going to say 4.2 kcals per mole. Right? The, the helmet with the Huffy bicycle doesn't change the big picture. You, you need to have some sort of a sense. That's about 1,000 to 1. Nobody cares whether it's 898 or 950 to 1. That's close to 1,000 to 1. And I expect you to take energies in kcals per mole and convert it into these ratios. OK, what if, it, if the, if the uh, equilibrium goes the other direction, 10 to 1 in favor of the starting materials? What's the free energy difference? Yeah, it's negative 1.4. And if it's 100 to 1 in favor of the starting materials? OK. So I expect you to be able to take free energies and convert them into ratios. And I expect you to be able to take ratios and convert them into free energies, kind of at this level of mathematics. You don't have to be a whiz at math to be able to add 1.4 kcals per mole or say, oh, there's three factors of 1.4 kcals per mole in there. So the, 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 really, the money relationship here is that this is worth about a factor of, of 10. You multiply factors, you add the free energies, factor of 10. And it's a factor of 10 in equilibrium constants or in rate constants. One thing is 10 times faster than the other. That means a transition state was 1.4 kcals per mole lower in energy. One thing was 10, 100 times slower. That means the transition state was 2.8 kcals per mole lower in energy. So factors of 10 in KEQ or, or rate constant, that's uh, lowercase k, uh, correspond to 1.4 kcals per mole. Now sometimes I get kind of advanced here with my math, and people tell me, well, there's two products in this reaction, and they formed into two, in a 2 to 1 ratio. And what do I do with that number, 2 to 1? It's not really 10 to 1, and it's not 1 to 1. That, that turns out to be correspond to 0 0.4 kcals per mole. So that's a factor of 2. Uh, and let me just say, in Keq or rate constant k, lowercase k. So <clears throat> a 0.4 kcal per mole difference, right? If things form in a 2 to 1 ratio competitively, that means one transition state was 0.4 kcals per mole lower in energy than the other one. So. I expect you to be able to take numerical ratios and, and to make free energy sense out of those, whether it's competing reactions, competing products forming, that means transition states, or whether it's just the two things equilibrating, 
then you're talking about ground state energies. All right, so um, <clears throat> let's see what we can do with that. Can we practice using these numbers? Because I, I expect you to be good at this. Here's two conformers, two chair-like conformers of ethyl cyclohexane. And there's a chair flip that goes on. We don't really care about the transition state. We just care about the fact that I'm telling you this equilibrates quickly. So they reached equilibrium. And if they're at equilibrium 20 to 1, what's the energy difference between these two conformers? What's the free energy difference at room temperature? That's right, it's 1.8. Let's talk about how you got that. It's a factor of 10 to 1. Well, it's a factor of 10 to 1 times a factor of 2 to 1. So what's a factor of 10 to 1? That's 1 1.4 kcals per mole. And then we add 0 0.4 kcals per mole. So that's the energy difference, 1.8 kcals per mole energy difference. And the one that's more stable is the one that's more populated. So that's, whoa, not 2. See, I'm not really... <laughs> Shows how good I am at math. 1.8 kcals per mole energy difference. That's kind of the most advanced that I get with my math here. That's kind of a 95 to 5 ratio. We usually measure things in percent. So 95 to 5, 94 to 6, 96 to 4. That's kind of 20 to 1. And so <clears throat> you should be able to work that equation. If it's 200 to 1, you should be able to work that. Um, Let's go ahead and take another example here. So again, I, I kind of put this in here. I just used these two numbers here, and I added the free energies, but you multiply the factors. Okay, here's an example down below. This is camptothecin. It's an anti-cancer molecule. It inhibits a, a DNA topoisomerase. That's not really important here. What's important is suppose you wanted to take, do a Fischer, uh, an acid hydrolysis of this ester right here in order to open up this lactone ring, this cyclic ester. That's called a lactone when you have a cyclic ester. So suppose you wanted to break that bond um, just by doing an acid hydrolysis. Um, what's the chance for this thing to work? Well, the thing that you need to know is that the product is plus 4.2 kcals per mole higher in energy. So if I throw in some catalytic acid and I allow this to reach equilibrium, what's the ratio of these going to be when I finally get to equilibrium? And that's what the acid's for. The acid's just there to accelerate the rate at which you reach equilibrium. Ten times more acid, you reach equilibrium ten times faster. What is that equilibrium ratio? Right? If I know this, what's that ratio going to be? Yeah, it's going to be a thousand to one ratio. And adding more acid is not going to help you. You're just going to get to that same equilibrium even faster. There's no way you're going to be able to use acid to hydrolyze that ring open. There's nothing you can do. It wants to be closed, um, uh, unfortunately, in this case. Now, there is a way to change the reaction. You can use base hydroxide anion to open that. And then it's a different product. It's the carboxylate anion. That is a completely different equilibrium constant. But playing around with acid, trying to do this hydrolysis, will never help you here. As once you understand equilibrium and equilibrium ratios and free energy, um, tells you that that's a hopeless transformation using acid. Okay, so sometimes we're th thinking about things that do not equilibrate. Here's two products uh, for a Diels-Alder reaction. So a Diels-Alder reaction is a, is a cycloaddition reaction. We can draw the reaction like this using these arrows here. I'm going to draw these arrows in a cyclic array. It's one of four types of, uh, of paracyclic, four classes of paracyclic processes cycloadditions are. Well, hopefully we'll get to those more later in this quarter. The mechanism is not important. What's important is you form two products, and the two products do not equilibrate. So if you got a 95 to 5 ratio at the end of the reaction, if it was 95% endo and 5% exo, that means it was a 95 to 5 ratio at the beginning of the reaction. Halfway through the reaction, the ratio is 95 to 5. When you get to the end of the reaction, the ratio is not. The ratio will be 95 to 5 from beginning to end because the transition state energy difference doesn't change uh, from the beginning to the end of the reaction. So if I know the ratio of these two products, well, then what's the difference in transition state energies? If I've got, if I if I draw some sort of a diagram here where I've got um, this free energy difference and some sort of mystical reaction coordinate and the starting material here. And there's two transition states, and one of them is lower in energy. It doesn't matter what the stabilities of the products are. So these ratios, we can convert those into a difference in transition state energies. The lower one here, the, the G double dagger, is that's not a well-drawn G double dagger, but that's for the, uh, the 
the, the more favorable one, the one that forms faster is the endo one, and the one that forms more slowly, that transition state is for the exo one. And what's the difference in energy between those two transition states? This is called kinetic selectivity. When it's not the stability of the products, you don't know anything about that. It's, it's the transition states going to those products that determines the final product ratio. So what's the free energy difference between those two? Well, if it's 100 to 1, if it's, if it's 10, if, it, if, it's, if it's 90 to 10, I would say that's about 1.4 kcals per mole, but this is 95 to 5. I'd say that's closer to 20 to 1. So what do we do to change this into 20 to 1? Yeah, it's, it, it's closer to 20 to 1 ratio, and that would be a factor of 10 and a factor of 2 to 1. And that's, again, 1.4 kcals per mole plus 0 0.4 kcals per mole. And that's 1.8, so kcals per mole. And 95.5 is a pretty common ratio that you see people report uh, when they report the results of chemical reactions. So it's not outlandish to talk, for me to talk about 95.5. People usually use percent yields that max out at 100. So they talk about 60, 40, 50, 50, 95.5, 90 to 10. Those are common numbers that you'll see. Um, and the numbers don't have to be add up to 100. People can just tell you, oh, I got 60% of this product and 5% of the other. You can convert that into a ratio. It doesn't matter what the percents add up to. You just know that they isolated two products, and you can make your own ratio out of that. All right, so you should learn to use these numbers and convert uh, numerical ratios into free energies and then go the other way around. Take a free energy and convert it into a numerical ratio. That is super powerful. Now, I'm going to just take a, a little break right here and talk about entropy. Entropy is really tricky. You know, that's part of delta G that we don't have an easy way to grasp. And let me try to explain to you why um, entropy will be the tough part of any class that you take in, in chemistry or organic chemistry. And the challenge behind entropy is that in order to understand entropy, you have to be able to visualize all possible states of a system. The infinity of all possible states has to be right there in your mind for you to grasp entropy. And that is very hard, right? <laughs> That's, if that were so easy, everybody could do chemistry. So let me put it into context of something that I think is simple, and that's the, a hydrogen bond. Like a hydrogen bond ought to be a pretty simple thing. We teach about hydrogen bonds in general chemistry. We teach about hydrogen bonds in, in organic chemistry. And I'll just tell you that if you take two water molecules and you, you form the ideal hydrogen bond with just the right angles and the correct angles, the idealized angles, that hydrogen bond makes that, that dimer 4.2 kcals per mole more stable by having that, that hydrogen bond in there. I can put an exact precise number. I could go out to nine decimal places with that and tell you exactly what energy that is worth with that hydrogen bond. But that doesn't really tell you enough, right? The problem is I'm not including entropy. If I really wanted to find out how many molecules have that hydrogen bond in solution, what I have to do is compare this ideal hydrogen bond state over, over here on my reactant side. I have to compare this situation with all other possible situations. Two water molecules that are bumping lone pairs into each other, or maybe a hydrogen bond that's at this weird distorted angle, or maybe two H's that are sterically bumping into each other. There is a multitude of other possible states that you need to compare that ideal hydrogen bond to. And so it turns out that when you look at, at all these other possible states, including hydrogen bonds that aren't at ideal angles or just are, are bent a little bit, when you look at all those other possible states, only one out of every 16 molecules exists in that ideal hydrogen bond state. All the other molecules exist in some other way. So I can tell you that that hydrogen bond is worth 4.2 or kcals per mole or 4. Point, I don't know I don't know why my numbers are different here. It doesn't doesn't matter. 4.2 or 4.6, I can tell you that it's more stable, but only one out of 16 molecules looks like that in solution. So knowing that it's more stable and not thinking about entropy 
kind of puts you at a disadvantage for how to use that number. So this is going to be the problem with entropy. So I'm going to take a famous example where um, two scientists sat down with a pencil and paper and worked out what is the entropic cost uh, for doing a Diels-Alder reaction. So in other words, again, doing one of these 6 plus 4 cycloaddition reactions where you line up this atom over here uh, on the left and these atom, two atoms over here on the right and you form bonds like that. You know, it's one thing to look at the bond changes and calculate enthalpy, but what's the cost of taking those two molecules and orienting them so that they are ready to form those two bonds. Because two molecules don't want to just sit there like that waiting to form those two bonds. That's, that's entropically expensive. And the reason why that picture will not help you is we're not talking about two molecules. We are talking about a mole of molecules. 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules. If you want to understand the entropic cost of a Diels-Alder reaction, imagine taking 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd ballroom dancers and saying, okay, everybody pair up. Don't start dancing, just pair up. 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. That'll take you forever to get that to happen. That pairing up is the entropic cost of bimolecular reactions where things have to collide with each other. So it turns out that the cost of bimolecular reactions, the entropic cost, in, like in this Diels-Alder reaction where you've got, the Diels-Alder is a really tough one because you have to get two ends of these molecules, both simultaneously to align with each other. And so in that case, where it's kind of a maximum, the highest, where things have to be perfectly aligned, that entropic cost of pairing up a mole of A's and a mole of B's, no bond formation just getting them near each other, ready to form the bonds, can cost you up to 14 kcals per mole. Less stable, just getting things to pair up. When you try to get two molecules to react with each other, bimolecular reactions, get ready to pay a price that's, that can be that high. And how many factors of 10 less stable is that? How many factors of 10 less stable is that than just having molecules flying all around? I got two situations here. I've got molecules just all over the place and molecules paired up and ready to react. Those aren't equally good situations. How many factors of 10 different is that? Yeah, 10 to the 10. 10 factors of 1.4 kcals per mole. So at equilibrium, if you allowed it to reach equilibrium, 10 to the 10 of those those moles of, of molecules would, would be completely disordered or have some other state, and then only one out of 10 to the 10 of those situations would have things completely ordered. And then after they're all paired up, then you can talk about forming bonds and paying the enthalpic price. So whenever you see a unimolecular reaction where something int intramolecularly is just kind of reaching around and reacting with itself, it doesn't have to pay that price. Intramolecular reactions are super favorable because they don't have to pay this entropic price of getting a mole of A's to collide in just the right way with a mole of B's. So whenever you see somebody publish their great new reaction and it's an intramolecular cyclization, they're scamming you. <laughs> they're just taking advantage of entropy to make their, their reaction look really good. Um, and in fact, it's, it's probably not that great if you're trying to do it in, in, intermolecularly uh, with freely diffusing species. All right, let's go ahead and talk about this, this cyclization thing. You know, cycl cyclization is not just a scam. A lot of molecules are cyclic in nature, in drug molecules. And so I want to show you, a, this is not a typical cyclization reaction. It's, it's one of the earliest ones that nobody has wanted to reproduce just because it takes a lot of energy. Where they're doing an SN, it's not an SN2, but it's a displacement reaction where you add to sigma star and form an oxygen carbon bond. And how easy is that reaction? <clears throat> when you try to do this intramolecularly, if you look at the varying possible ring sizes. So it's a, it's a little bit wacky here because there's an sp2 carbon in that ring. You can't get away from that because of the system they chose, but they couldn't do this with just the alkoxide. You get too much E2 elimination. Well, if you look at forming a three-membered ring, that sucks. Trying to make a three-membered ring like that, well, why is that so slow? Yeah, ring strain. There's 26, well, in this case with the sp2, for a simple cyclopropane, there's 27 kcals per mole of ring strain, right? Convert that into factors of 10. 
27 kilocalories per mole if you're a three-membered cyclopropane. Three-membered rings are not happy. Enthalpically, they are not happy. Four-membered rings, it's not quite so bad. <clears throat> In fact, it's a little bit faster than just having two molecules collide with each other. Notice that I'm comparing all of this to this rate for just an intermolecular process where two molecules collide with each other separately. Four-membered ring is a little bit faster than just having two things, so you get a little bit of an advantage in this particular case with this, with this sp2 center in the ring. Five-membered rings are the fastest, and that is generally true all the time. If you're looking at rates of cyclization, if you're designing your own reaction and you want it to work well, your own bond forming process, try to make a five-membered ring with it. That's your best chance for success, right? Look at the rate advantage here. It's a hundred, and this is, right, a hundred times faster for the rate constant for cyclization when you're trying to form five-membered rings. So, and, and that's not crazy. Sometimes it's a thousand times faster. Five-membered rings form fast. The chance of colliding when you're five atoms away is way higher. It's hard to get away when you're, when you're covalently linked by five, five, um, by whatever that is, four bonds. Six-membered rings are, are usually close to five, but not as good. So if you have a reaction, a cyclization reaction that forms a six-membered ring, you are in, right? Five and six are usually the great ones. This, this case is a little bit unusual because four-membered ring formation is fast. If I take a different reaction that forms rings, the, this plot would look a little bit different, but five and six would still be the best. If we look at seven-membered rings, we've lost all the advantage. It's faster to just have two molecules collide in solution. And finally, we get, we get to eight-membered rings. We're not going to talk about this quite right now, but that sucks. You try to make an eight-membered ring in organic chemistry, you're just going to get molecules reacting intermolecularly. Turns out that the middle of the ring starts bumping into each other. We call those transannular interactions. You're going to have a hard time making an eight-membered ring. There is all kinds of shenanigans that people use to make eight-membered rings because you can't directly cyclize to make eight-membered rings. And as you get bigger and bigger and bigger, you, you know, you, you get a little better but you're just always gonna have a problem to try to, to try to make macro cyclic rings of 12, 14, 16 uh, atoms in, in ring size. And once you get to those, those, those long chains and you're trying to cyclize, I mean, the problem is that that chain just has so many possible conformers, right? The conformer that you want that's going to cyclize without strain, Right, there's 177,000 conformations that that chain can adopt, and only one of them is going to be that strain-free conformation that makes the ring. That's the problem with entropy, is all those other conformations that aren't going to do anything. So, Okay, so when you see in this class somebody who's got two possible reactions, an intramolecular reaction that makes a five- or six-membered ring, or goes through a five- or six-membered ring transition state, versus two things colliding with each other separately, like an SN2 reaction, or something, right? The intramolecular reaction has this huge advantage if you're making five and six member rings over other reactions, over side reactions, um, things like that. Okay, so when I give you kcals per mole, I expect you to convert that into ratios. If you see a ratio, a ratio of yields, r product ratio, I expect you to convert that into free energies and know how to convert that approximately into free energies. You've seen kind of the level at which I do math. It's not super complex. Um, and if you see any, any arrow pushing reaction that can go through a five or six member transition state, that's money. And, right, and that's all about entropy. Well, most of it, there was some strain stuff in here too. All right, I wanted to make a little mention of something here. And, and sometimes I put these, these references, you'll notice that two of the references in here are, are mine from work that we just recently published that I, I don't usually talk about my reactions and put them into our problem sets, but uh, we did something I, as I did it, I thought might have value. So as you know, in this class, we've talked about these, these trends for frontier molecular orbitals. You know, I, I kind of expect you to know that, it's, that the canonical frontier orbitals, the filled and unfilled, have these relative energies. And then if you go from one atom to something that's more electromagnetic, of carbon to nitrogen to oxygen to fluorine, I expect you to know that, the, that as you go to a more electronegative atom, the lone pairs on those atoms get less and less nucleophilic. Lower in energy, less nucleophilic. But I'm not telling you how much less nucleophilic. Right? These are just kind of qualitative diagrams. 
right? If I, if I take bonds, carbon-carbon bonds, you don't do SN2 reactions on carbon-carbon bonds. As you replace one of those carbons with a more electronegative atom, it starts to look realistic uh, to, to break a carbon-fluorine bond by adding to the antibonding orbital. Um, you know, we've, so we learn these effects, like these effects, uh, how they affect rates of reaction, but I haven't told you anything quantitative about that. And so I want to show you a, a, a couple of resources that you have to try to make quantitative sense out of these trends. First place that I would direct you to look, if you're trying to figure out, well, okay, I know that's more reactive, but what is more reactive? Is an enolate more reactive or is an amine more reactive? How would you know that? Well, <clears throat> there is a database that was put together by Herbert Meyer. Um, he just retired, but his group spent about 30 years collecting, creating this, uh, this set of nucleophilicity parameters and electrophilicity parameters for thousand, well, uh, for, for over a thousand uh, combinations of nucleophile solvent pairs and for different electrophiles. So if you want to know, you know, what's more nucleophilic, for example, a stabilized enolate or maybe just a simple alkene, you can look at his, at his tables and find on a logarithmic scale what's more nucleophilic. Right? It turns out that the enolate with this value of 12.8 is more nucleophilic by about 16 orders of magnitude, 10 to the 16. So right? it's not just a matter of drawing out some qualitative MO diagram. Right? You can go ask, what's the effect of having an O minus on your alkene versus a chlorine on your alkene? It makes a big difference what your substituent on that alkene is, whether it's an enolate or just a simple alkene. Or if you're trying to judge the, the relative energies of a CH bond versus a pi bond, right, you can find examples and then try to say, hey, I, I, I can see how many orders of magnitude more reactive one is versus the other. So you can use these numbers in this table um, to help you think about differences in lone pair reactivity, pi bond reactivity, and sigma bond reactivity. The problem with this is it doesn't have a lot of the simple functional groups. Like, what if you wanted to know an aldehyde versus an acyl chloride or a CC bond? Should you start your arrow with a CC bond? Well, you can't look that number up. No, that's just too hard to measure. Or how about a T-butyl carbanion or a methyl anion? There's nothing, nobody's ever going to measure that. And so we found a way to create numbers for those and put them on this scale. So now, if you want to know the relative uh, uh, reactivity on the Meyer scale for a T-butyl carbanion versus a CC bond, well, here's some numbers for you. 48 orders of magnitude difference. Now, this is scaled to one very particular electrophile, the Meyer electrophile. It's his reference electrophile. If you picked a choosier electrophile that's not very reactive, the scale would, would extend. It would, be a bigger, it would be a bigger scale. But he scales everything to this reference cation, to how fast things would react to that reference cation. So we did too. So if you need to know, you know, just simple double bond versus a benzene ring. There you go. It's like four orders of magnitude more reactive. Aromaticity costs costs energy to lose aromaticity. 10,000 times slower. If you've got a double bond somewhere around in your molecule, don't try to do electrophilic aromatic substitution. You're just going to add the electrophile to the CC double bond somewhere else in your substrate. Um, right? If you wanted to know the difference between oxygen lone pairs or maybe oxygen ethers, right? two orders of magnitude. That, um, so this is a better scale than using things like pKa's um, uh, to judge nucleophilicity. And, and we also created another scale, and this is not dependent on any reference electrophile um, for the reactivity of electrophiles. What's the most reactive functional group in organic chemistry? Uh, it's carbonyls, great. Most of the reactions you see will be with carbonyls. It's a cyanocation, and you won't find that any, in any liquid reaction on the planet Earth. You have to go to outer space to find that species where things are in a vacuum. And what's the least reactive functional group in organic chemistry? The one you never start arrows from. Yeah, maybe a carbon-carbon bond. If I had a carbon fluorine, that would be lower, but you know that's not on. <laughs> you, you very rarely see uh, organofluorine chemistry. 180 orders of magnitude from the most reactive to the least reactive. You know, the 180 orders of magnitude is like that's more than the number of atoms in the universe. You don't even need units when you use numbers that big because it doesn't. There's no conversion factor that will change that dramatically. Right? The span of reactivity of electrophilicity in organic chemistry is absolutely massive. So what are these numbers? They, they are, they are um, 
ion affinities. We're, we're basically just calculating how much energy do you get if you add a methyl anion to one of these electrophiles, and then I'm scaling it to the Meyer scale. And in the previous case, when we were looking at nucleophiles, we were just judging how much energy do you get if you add one of these nucleophiles to a methyl cation, and then just scaling it to the Meyer scale. But there is no place else, no textbook, no place else in organic chemistry that you can go to get these numbers so that you can make a sense out of orbital effects like electronegativity. You want to know what electronegativity does? Well, let's go from like a CO bond to a CC bond. You can get those numbers out of here and put some quantitative numbers on there. So uh, it, it's worth taking a look at, at Meyer's uh, amazing work. He invented this, the nucleophilicity and electrophilicity parameters uh, and got most of the common numbers, yeah. Um, oh, this one? Yeah. Uh, so, certainly when he first started off and still throughout most of his career, all of his numbers were derived from kinetic experiments where you put stuff in a cuvette and watch the color change. And so this is a molecule that undergoes a UV change okay. when you put it, when you react things with it. It loses conjugation. So the red, the red cation disappears as the reaction goes. So, um, and so a lot of his reactions were one of his two things was reacting with something that had color, and the color disappeared. Yeah? So it's for the, like for the electrophilicity, or like the methyl, um, why is there such a huge gap? Like, it's, like on the number line you gave, there, there's a 10 to the 40 gap. Yeah, there was nothing in between there that I thought was worth, worth putting in. I, I could probably find, dream up some molecule that would have been in that gap, but I, I was just trying to pick some common functional groups, simple or simple functional groups in the case of cyano. Um, and of the common things that were small, I, I didn't see anything in that gap. But I could design something that would fit in that gap just to fill it in. Um, but again, you're never going to see a, a, an acetylide cation. That's so unstable and so reactive. That's only in outer space you'll see those species. Um, so really, anything above here. Right, we're not ever going to talk about those. Those won't, won't be relevant to anything but space, cosmochemistry, cosmoorganic chemistry. Yeah? Do you recommend us to memorize any of them? No, not at this stage. Um, but if you did, you'd be, amazing. You'd, be, you'd be amazingly smart if you did. Even I can't remember all the numbers here. Sadly, because I spent uh, decades training to use PKAs to guess, using basicity to teach myself about nucleophilicity, I still refer back to PK table. It's going to take me a while to shift to this. Yeah? So the, the, um, like the, the two all the way on the right, the ones that you said could only exist in our space, could those exist as salts? N no. Like Zero chance. Existence? Zero chance. If you put that, if you put any of these into a solvent, it would pull an H off of the solvent molecule. It, 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 probably at diffusion control rates. You know, this kind of a scale allows you to ask questions like, well, what happened if I put this and then sprayed a jet of that <laughs> towards Teflon on a surface? Now you're starting to talk about unstoppable cannonball and immovable post and which one, you know, philosophical questions like that. Um, but we're, um, yeah, really you should kind of stop here. You know, the, your thinking should really stop here to talk, because these are species you do see people draw, whether they're realistic or not tert butyl carbocation. There's no published number um, for that. You know, methyl cation. Those are species we do talk about the stabilities of, like MTP orbitals. Um, but you can see the effect of SP hybridization kills you here. It's just so unrealistic. Okay, so um, there's a place you can go to get quantitative numbers, not just these qualitative MO diagrams, not just bond length and conjugation, but what, what are the actual numbers if you wanted to get numbers and compare them? <clears throat> okay, um, I'm going to stop right there, um, and when we come back, I'm still regretting it. It's like this is supposed to be a course about mechanisms and arrow pushing, and we really haven't started doing any mechanisms or arrow pushing. So it's frustrating to have to take my time and talk about energy and entropy and stuff like that, but that was some necessary lead-in. When we come back on Wednesday, we're going to do our first stuff with uh, thinking about reactions, and unfortunately boring ones, acid-base reactions. And then we'll finally start talking about carbocations, rearrangements, arrow pushing, cool stuff.